All right, everyone, a fairly major escalation in what's going on, you know, not that far to the east of where I am in the Netherlands, so you know, hold on to your fucking asses. Uh, uh, Putin has decided to move uh, tactical nuclear systems to uh, Belarus. Now, Belarus hasn't had any nukes in it since the 90s. They gave them up as part of the separation of the Soviet Union. The, uh, the other states that formed outside of Russia uh, ceded their nuclear systems to Russia. I bet the Ukrainians uh, <laughs> wish that they hadn't gotten rid of all of them at the moment. Uh, so Belarus didn't have any nuclear weapons in it. Now, now they will. Now, and is this uh, equivalent antagonism to things that NATO has already done? Yeah, uh, having so many weapon systems, including nuclear systems, drawn up near the Russian border... Uh, not just tactical weapons, but, but others as well, air-based nuclear systems. Hell, nuclear-capable uh, subs that float around in the ocean, and you don't even know where they are at all times. Uh, by the way, North Korea has more submarines than anyone. That should probably worry people as they develop better drone technology and weapons that are a bit smaller and more compact. They could actually do some damage, and they're threatening to build tsunami weapons. I think they got that idea from the Russians, uh, ironically enough. Um, while that's the case, and NATO has engaged in similar behavior, what we're seeing right now is the spiral of one-upsmanship that led to like the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, there is no attempt at real diplomacy. There's not a lot of communication east and west. You have some attempts by middleman states like Turkey to an extent, although again, they've, they've leaned towards the NATO side, which makes sense since they're NATO. We see a, a newly expanding NATO. Um, we see Russia uh, building new weapon systems and invading a neighbor. Um, we, we see all sorts, we, basically everything that can go wrong is going wrong and there's no attempt at any form of reproachment or diplomacy. Again, the sort of situation that led to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Everyone keeps trying to one-up one another. At some point, you either hit a flashpoint and have a nuclear war, or people realize how goddamn dangerous the situation is, and cooler heads hopefully prevail, or someone blinks. So somebody unilaterally says, okay, we're not going to deal with this anymore. We're going to withdraw our systems, assuming in good faith that they're going to do so, do so as well and not just invade us because that would bring about World War III. And that's why I'm not particularly worried about this particular era of brinksmanship. The fact is that if Russia and NATO keep moving systems towards each other, attempting to gobble up any of the intermediate land that lies between Russia and NATO's sphere... Um, if everything continues at this particular pace, even if someone blinks, which normally would result in the breakdown of MAD and potentially a nuclear catastrophe, uh, the only way to win the, uh, the game of the grand chessboard was never to play it. Unfortunately, we've got a bunch of players in it. Uh, so it's, it's unwinnable at this point. I've already explained why years ago. Uh, any attempt to solve it through, uh, uh, through defense systems, new weapons, uh, or, or the unilateral disarmament of a country leads to the breakdown of MAD and actually leads to World War III, which would be nuclear. Uh, that's why they're still playing the game. That being said, I don't think it happens this time. What'll happen is that they will keep one-upping each other until no more one-upping can be done. It will cost more and more to do this, and at some point somebody will have an economic crisis big enough to prevent them from wanting to continue, and then things begin to withdraw. Now, the reason why NATO wouldn't therefore immediately invade Russia or Russia sensing blood in the water immediately invades Europe is because they can't. Russia doesn't have any... Once, once Finland joins NATO, there's no one left to invade. The countries there, Moldova and Belarus, which gets the nukes, are on Russia's side. Putin's not going to invade them. He's already invaded Ukraine, and there's no longer any land border with a nation that Russia doesn't do hefty business with. Mongolia, fellow commie country, by the way, to China. They're in China's sphere, mostly. China itself, nuclear, friendly with Russia generally. Central Asian countries reliant upon Russia effectively for their entire economies. They ain't going anywhere. There's nowhere left to go. The grand chessboard has been carved up. Now, further beyond that, only diplomacy, subversion, and regime change can change anything. By the way, NATO probably was involved with trying to do this in Kazakhstan not that long ago. This probably delayed uh, certain other military operations that Putin had in mind. Now we've got the, the, we've got the Finns presumptively joining NATO. Turkey gave the green light. I'm not sure if uh, Hungary is still holding out. Um, NATO is increasing its weapons production and, and budgeting. 
uh, to a significant extent. By the way, Donald Trump uh, got that ball rolling. Thank you, Donald. <laughs> Otherwise, right now, uh, Russia probably would be uh, quite a bit further in Ukraine. Some people would be happy about that. I don't know. Pick your poison, I guess. Imagine being a Ukrainian. Hey, power-mad oligarch just invaded our country. Hmm, should I side with him or the power-mad oligarch who is already here? I don't know. Depends on what kind of economic system you want, I suppose. Otherwise, nothing really changes other than the road signs, I suppose. Sort of like what happens to Poland. Why do you think the Polish right now are rearming so much? Why do you think they're so centrally involved in everything going on? Germany on one side is building more tanks, and the Russians are starting to build things too. If you're Polish, you probably start getting a little bit nervous. <laughs> Can I really count on my allies here? Well, I want to be self-sufficient. Maybe Pol maybe Warsaw will get the nuke. Uh, you know, stranger things have happened. Anyway, uh, so we've got tactical nukes going to Belarus, and by summer, only in a few months uh, from now, they'll have a storage facility. These are short range and low yield, and the idea is to use them if an invasion happens, so you can take out the entire column with one hit. Uh, the United States developed similar systems, although the Davy Crockett, which was really cool, it's literally the, the uh, little nukes in Fallout, uh, you know, those that are so much fun to launch at uh, Super Mutants. Uh, it's basically a, an adaptation of the concept of the Davy Crockett, and it's a similar system. The Russians supposedly managed to miniaturize nukes enough to fit them in a briefcase. Jury's out on whether they actually accomplished that or not, but they have uh, low-yield uh, tactical nukes. It is a form of aggression. It's brinksmanship. It's nuclear one-upsmanship. It's not helpful. It's warmongering crap. NATO is doing the same thing, though. And in the end, I don't think that we're like, you know, 10 milliseconds to midnight, because we sort of gone through this before. And when we went through it before, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and this was admitted two years later. There were active potential plans for the U.S. And, and the Soviets to attack one another. The Soviets figured they could get in a sneaky attack, maybe, and debilitate systems ahead of time. And the U.S. said, hey, but we have three-to-one missile superiority, so if we hit them really, really hard all at once and even cripple some of their systems, yeah, they'll still nuke us, but most Americans will be fine because not enough nuclear weapons exist in the Soviet arsenal to destroy us. And so there were actually legit plans for that, but a lot has changed since the middle of the 1960s. Both nations have many more nukes, and many other nations have nukes as well. That kind of war is no longer survivable for any of the potential players in that war game. Uh, it, it changes fundamentally the grand chessboard. Ironically, the fact that there's so many more and so many better nukes kind of makes things less likely to pop off. You're more flippant about it if you think your nation can survive while destroying the enemy entirely. Well, both sides were convinced of that before. I don't think any serious person anymore in the political arena in any of these countries still believes it's a survivable world scenario when 10, 15,000 nukes go off at the same time. I think the general consensus is even if you don't get a nuclear winter, all the players have nuked each other into ashes. They've been collapsed. A bunch of other countries, mostly in the southern hemisphere with any particular power, become the new world powers. You would effectively be making the Australians, the Argentinians, the Brazilians, and people like that the new masters of the world. It'd be a very interesting world. I guess the Portuguese uh, colonial period paid off in the end after all because of where their land happens to be located. That's about all. Peace out.